for everybody. And it's hard. It's hard no matter. And it's not just about being a parent. It's about being a caregiver too. So yeah, it's tough. It's tough no matter what. Thank you. I, I'm sure that's much appreciated. Um, in typical Beloit College fashion, I'm going to privilege one of the questions since we typically invite students to offer the first question. And so when I see a question from a student, we're going to, we're going to jump off with that one. Um, and the question is, what led you to become an Egyptologist and then yes. a space archaeologist? <laughs> so, so I talked a little bit about that in my um, in my talk today to the high school and middle school students, you know, I was inspired by my grandfather, who was one of the pioneers, who's a forestry professor at the University of Maine. And he was one of the pioneers in using aerial photography for forestry in the 1940s and 1950s. It sounds very like, of course, we'd use aerial photography to map forests in the same way that in 50 years, everyone's going to be like, well, of course, we use satellite images to map archaeological sites. It's the same thing. Um, so he's the reason I took my first remote sensing course as an undergraduate. He inspired me to get into it. Egyptology is weird. It's very weird. Every Egyptologist will tell you what I'm about to tell you. And that is from a very young age, the age of our parents tell us, you, you know, you were young. We don't know how young you were, three, four, five. Um, you started talking about Egypt. Now, I grew up in Bangor, Maine in the 1980s. This is pre-cable, pre-internet. It sounds like the dark age is kind of, and yet it wasn't. And I'm really glad I had like a 1950s childhood for all sorts of reasons. Um, there are no weird pictures of me on the internet from high school. Thank, thank goodness. Um, but, uh, but anyway, you know, like there, in other words, there was, no, there was no thing that would have inspired me to study Egypt. You know, I'm pretty sure it was National Geographic, looking at images of Egypt, um, reading about discoveries in newspapers. But there wasn't a moment I remember going, I'm going to be an Egyptologist. I remember from a young age being obsessed, going to the Fairbanks Public Library. I told the students today, my childhood, um, you know, I grew up in a place exactly like Beloit, Bangor. Today has, I think, about 35,000 people. So it's almost identical in size to Beloit. I looked at pictures of Beloit online and your downtown looks kind of like our downtown, sort of mid to late um, uh, 19th century, um, kind of cool, kind of funky, kind of, Anyway, it's, it's wild. So I told the students, like, I, I had your childhood. Like, that was my life growing up. And there's no rhyme or reason to me becoming an Egyptologist. Just every Egyptologist will say we, we became inspired from a young age. And that, that's what did it. <laughs> that's great. Um, so from, on the one end, your, your um, formative years to a much more recent question, um, in your work in the various parts of the world, have you ever encountered any evidence of past pandemics? Um, I've definitely, you know, in working on diverse um, archaeological excavations, you wonder why people died. If you see large groups of people buried together, could they have been killed by war? Was it plague? You know, at one archaeological site, there was this quote unquote plague pit. Um, I didn't excavate it, but I was there the season it was found. Was it a plague pit? Was it not? Who knows, but, but definitely, of course, there are many, many uh, archeological projects all around the world that have uncovered evidence of past plagues, pandemics, diseases. Um, so I'm not a specialist in ancient bones by any stretch of the imagination. I, can, I know enough to be able to ask the right questions and to understand what different bone parts are uh, or different bones are, but um, I'm not a specialist. So specifically my work hasn't focused on pandemics or you know, I've only tangentially been connected to it, but certainly a number of my colleagues have, have done that work. So on a, I'm not sure if it's a related note or not, but how do you do deal with people who don't believe in science? Um, <laughs> it depends. So I, you know, I, I know my voice is pretty strong. You know, I've got nearly 75,000 followers now on Twitter and I've got a blue check mark and that's not to be taken lightly. Um, so I use my platform. Uh, for those of you that follow me on Twitter, you know I'm sometimes a little naughty. I speak out on issues of the day. I will not get political one way or another. I respect diverse political views, uh, but I certainly do not respect views that um, actively cause harm to large segments of the population, i.e. people who don't believe in getting vaccines. You know, we'd be, we would be out of the pandemic by now if people had socially distanced and worn masks and followed protocols and we're actively getting vaccines. You know, I have friends that are in New Zealand and they have lived 
normal lives for almost a year. The pandemic there, I mean, occasionally there are many lockdowns, but they will not have long-term, long-lasting psychological damage in the way that all of us will. All of us are gonna have PTSD from this. I, 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 let me tell you a little bit of a story. When I was growing up, you know, the, um, the, uh, the wife of the grandfather who inspired me, my, my wonderful grandmother, she grew up in the, and she was born in 1917. So she grew up during the Great Depression. And we always made fun of her because you would open her fridge and her freezer and her pantry. And it was like she was preparing for a war. She hoarded. Guess who hoards now? All of us. We are all hoarders. We have flipped into lockdown mentality. And we will have that for all of our lives. Our grandchildren, great-grandchildren will make fun of us for hoarding. We've, we've, we've been flipped. So like I'm kind of my grandmother now. I also, I wrote an op-ed for the... Um, um, for the Boston Globe. Um, if you just Google Sarah Parkak Boston Globe, I talk about my great grandmother who I lost uh, and never met her. She of course died you know, 60 years before I was, was born, uh, but she died in the, the, the great influenza epidemic in 19, 18, 19, 19. And so my family has been, um, I wouldn't be alive ironically if she had lived. She would, my whole family would have been different. So the pandemic has done something to my brain. So I'm trying to be compassionate towards people because sometimes if you're compassionate and you show some empathy, there's a door. And if there's a door and you get someone to stop for a second and think, there's a chance. Um, you know, I try to, especially on Twitter, engage with people who, Sometimes you have to parse it out, right? If it's, if it's the, well, actually, dudes on Twitter who mansplain, um, I will throw them off the bus into the deepest, darkest abyss possible. But if, it's a, if I get a sense that the person, maybe, because I always read the bios, and sometimes from the bios, you can get a sense, maybe this person is trying to engage in good faith. And so I'll respond. I say, hey, like, I know you think aliens built the pyramids, but have you read a book? Have you heard of this thing called a book that has words in between a hard cover that, that, that are written by experts who've studied these things? Here's some books and you can get them at a place called a library, which is a place that you can get books for free. And, and you know, about 80% of the time, I get a thank you back. Like, I, you know what, I, I didn't know about knowledge. And I've watched the History Channel a lot, but no one's ever talked to me about these book things. I'm gonna go read a book. And that's one person you've convinced because if they start reading a single book, that's it, they're converted. So it's hard now though, it's hard, right? Because you get people who, who claim that, that science is, you know, it's, oh, it's the belief. We, we, we don't believe in science. Well, go jump off a bridge and let me know if physics is working for you or not. Science does not care whether you believe in it or not. COVID does not care whether or not you believe it exists. COVID loves that you don't wanna wear a mask. Thank you very much. We are going to mutate and kill a lot more of you and spread faster. Um, it's just, it's hard. It's really hard and the, you know, um, this is, this is a, a lot of my people did not do a good enough job fast enough. You know, a lot of the white nationalists who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, um, they co-opted symbols and ideologies from the classical world, from the Viking world, um, from indigenous Native North Americans. I mean, you saw the, the crazy guy with the, the, the horn helmet. Um, you know, lots of this, this Molin Labe people are saying. Um, anyway, it's all subversion, it's all misappropriation, it's all racism, it's all white nationalism. And my field didn't understand fast enough that all of this was happening. And so they didn't speak out enough fast enough, it's generational, it's changing. We have a long, difficult road ahead of us. So you can, I mean, this is something about which I'm really passionate. I wanna get ancient aliens canceled. That is the most racist, horrible show possible. And if you haven't realized how ancient aliens is racist, I will tell you in 10 seconds, any program that exists to remove the agency of our extraordinary creative ancestors who may or may not have had darker skin and put that creativity in the hands of aliens and tells you that they weren't capable, that's the literal definition of racism. And here's a show that's been airing for a decade or more, and now it has millions of viewers every week. And that is a gateway drug to all sorts of not nice things on the internet. So, you know, it's the fault of um, uh, commissioners at TV channels, it's the fault of media. And by the way, left and right, they're not, there's not an innocent side to this, both sides have helped to fuel this debate. Um, you know, we have a long, long road ahead of us and I will actively speak out against it 
as long as I am capable. Because ultimately, look, the ancient world is amazing and it has so much to teach us. Um, you know, the, the ancient Greeks knew that if you like stayed inside your house and didn't interact with other people, the pandemic wouldn't spread. So if the ancient Greeks figured this out 2000 years ago, how come people today aren't figuring it out? And I know it's tough, but we could be like New Zealand and we're not. And we're all gonna need therapy for the rest of our lives as a result of not believing in science. I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. That was a soapbox question, I apologize. <laughs> Oh, don't apologize because I'm going to turn it right around on you. Because one of the questions is, have you ever been wrong and how do you deal with it? Yeah, of course I've been wrong. You know, that, that's, that, so that's the problem, right? With these people that, that don't believe in science. They're like, yeah, but you were wrong. It's like, yes, I was. Science is a grand experiment and you're going to be wrong a lot and you're going to fail a lot. And if you don't understand that, like, Literally, the definition of to experiment is to try. Like science experiments, you're going to fail a lot. You're going to be wrong a lot. You're going to have these hypotheses. You're going to test all these things. But you know what? After hundreds and hundreds of times of testing things and throwing things against the wall, eventually one's going to kind of stick and sputter down a little bit. And then you throw it a little harder, it's going to stick harder, and eventually it's going to stick to the wall. And that's going to be a theory that you publish in a paper. And that's going to help change the field. So yeah, I've been wrong. I've, I've thought things were archeological sites that turned out to be modern features. It happens. I have dismissed, it's actually one of my favorite stories to tell um, when we were looking for potential Viking sites um, at, uh, in Scotland on this island called uh, Popper Store, which is in the, in the um, Shetland Islands. Um, uh, there is a very clear rectilinear feature uh, that was showing up next to a house in one of the islands. And it was such a clear feature that my colleagues looked at, they're like, oh, do you think this could potentially be a Viking longhouse? But it's ridiculous. It's like modern gas lines. It's even aligned with the modern house that's next to it. There is no way that is Viking. No way. Everything modern, you know, everything you typically find in an archeological site that is in alignment with modern structures and features that is that clear, it's always modern. And they're like, yeah, we, we're just gonna check it out. I'm like, no, don't, really don't check it out. Like hundred times before, I'm telling you, it's modern. Guess what? It was a massive Viking longhouse that had been there for hundreds of years. We ended up finding a, a, a carved, worked, gorgeous carnelian bead that probably came all the way from, um, uh, could have come all the way from Egypt. It was an extraordinary structure. It could have been royal. I was totally wrong. It happens. I'm cool with it. I hope, I hope people prove me wrong in the future, right? I hope people take the, the work I've done, the theories I've suggested and show how I'm wrong. This is how the field advances. I am super cool with being wrong. And my eight-year-old tells me at least 10 times a day I'm wrong. So I'm used to it. <laughs> All right, so we have some questions about sort of where you've worked and where you'd like to return. So going back to the um, Alex Trebek story, which seems to have resonated with some folks, um, what locations do you think would have stumped him or would have stumped you had he asked? And are there places that you would just really love to return? Boy, yeah, I've been able to work in many, many countries all over the world. Um, so yeah, if he'd asked me about Southeast Asia, I mean, I, I've looked at my colleagues' work and I've visited some of those places, but I've never worked in Cambodia specifically. I mean, does it count if I, what counts as having worked somewhere, like looking on Google Earth? You know, I only count the places where I've done active, collaborative, scientific research with my colleagues. Um, you know, large parts of South America, you know, worked in Peru, but certainly not, not in Colombia, not in Ecuador, um, uh, not in Bolivia, um, you know, large, large parts of Central America. I've done a little bit of work in Mexico and, and, and um, Honduras, I guess, and a little bit of work in Belize. So yeah, and does it count like having dug versus having done remote sensing work there? So I guess both. Um, yeah, I, you know, large areas in Europe. Um, you know, I haven't done a lot of work in Eastern Europe. Uh, I haven't worked in Russia. Um, Central Asia, I've done some work in Kazakhstan, but I haven't looked in other places. So yeah, I mean, I've definitely worked in many places all over the world, um, but he could have stumped me. Like, I, yeah, I hadn't done work in Australia. He just didn't pick right. The odds weren't typically not in his favor though, so. Uh, but yeah, where would I like to work? Oh man, so many places, so many places I wanna work. Um, you know, I'm fascinated with Central Asia. There are just extraordinary archaeological features there that haven't been properly mapped. Um, I love the work my colleagues are doing in Cambodia. I mean, I, I wouldn't, like, I've been able to travel there. It's extraordinary archaeology. I don't know that I'd 
want to do remote sensing work there, but I would definitely love to go back. Um, it was a dream. Um, man, I haven't been to Easter Island yet. Um, my, two of my friends, Carl Lipo uh, and Terry Hunt, are the are collaborating partners on a major archaeological project, and we, we've, we've agreed to trade. I'm going to show them Egypt, and they're going to show me Easter Island. Uh, and I do not want to pass up the opportunity to get a tour of Easter Island from two archaeologists combined together who have 60 years of archaeological experience working there. Like to me, that's the coolest part of the work that I do, getting to travel to these amazing places and getting tours of archaeological sites from these world-class explorers and archaeologists. I mean, I've had you know tours of Cambodia by my friend Dr. Damien Evans, who's worked there for 25 years. I had a tour um, of uh, of of Lonzo Meadows, who's a great Viking. Um, archaeological site in the northern part of Newfoundland from Brigida Wallace, you know, this eminent, Eminos Grise, the, the great, one of the great explorers and, and, and archaeologists who's worked there, um, you know, and on and on and on and on and on. I've just, all over the world, I, I've gotten these great tours. So to me, that's, that's why I like to set up my travel um, so that I can, I can get tours. My husband and I, now, of course, our son can get tours of these sites from our, from our amazing colleagues. Um, it's just a real privilege and a joy. So anywhere I can go to get, to get visits of sites where my colleagues are working, I'm, I'm all over it. You know, as long as there's good food, and good birding. I love I love watching birds. Um, so if there's good food and good bird life and good archaeology, I'll I'll be there as soon as the pandemic's over. That's wonderful. Um, so to take you from you know 100 miles in the air down to the nitty gritty, um, some questions about so what it's really like to dig in an Egyptian tomb. So and specifically about cats and cats being buried in Egyptian tombs. Can you yeah. can you give us kind of a sense of what it's like to really dig in an Egyptian tomb? Sure, so cats, first of all, so yeah, so cats, uh, cats were buried, cats were mummified, cats were considered great pets. I mean, you know, for those of you that have cats, you know, they think they're little gods and goddesses, especially the lady cats. Um, so you can understand why all of them are like, you are not an ancient Egyptian and you are not worshiping me. So I'm just going to saunter by and go pee on that thing over there because you did not worship me appropriately. Um, that's exactly how cats function. Um, what is it like to dig? It's it's it just so, and I hate to do a plug because I don't like plugging my own work, but my, my book, Archaeology from Space, How the Future Shapes Our Past, it should be at your local library um, or your local indie bookstore if you want to buy it. And I talk in detail about what it's like with life on a dig, you know, a lot more evocative language than I think I'm capable of at this current moment. Um, it's this whirlwind of dust and a cacophony of activity and people and sound. There are a hundred people going on and it's like a hundred out of control science experiments at the same time. Um, and there's Arabic and people shouting and chaos and things being moving around and, and, and it's, there's never still, there's never stillness on a dig except for right at the beginning, right at the morning, right as the mist is clearing. Um, it's, um, it's magical. You know, it's one of these things where it's, um, you think a minute has passed and six hours has passed and you think six hours has passed and only a minute has passed. Time doesn't really have much meaning on an archeological site. They're timeless. You get into a zone, um, there's, so, there's peace in spite of all the chaos of digging. There's a rhythm to it. There's a sensibility to it. Um, there, you know, and it, and it's not like you're just digging six hours a day. You get on site, you have your tea, your coffee, you start your work. You know, after an hour and a half, there's a tea break, you keep working, there's a quick snack break. So there's lots of breaks throughout the day. You're drinking water, you're staying hydrated. Um, it's never boring, not for a second. Um, if you're ever bored while digging, it's not a good sign. Um, sure, it can be tedious and monotonous. It's hard, right? You're often in the hot sun, you're working away, you're bagging, you're tagging. But anytime I start to get that sense, I'll just take a minute, I'll recalibrate, I'll recenter, I'll stick my head up. I'll look around, you know, I'll just try to feel gratitude because who else gets to dig up things that are hundreds or thousands of years old? It's such an enormous privilege. Um, so I, try, I try to have this great sense of gratitude when I'm in the field because I'm doing the thing I wanted to do when I was a small kid and I never want to take that for granted, not for a second. Thank you. So some practical questions. Okay, I know I have at least a couple students in the audience and some of the other guests are also interested in language. So what are the kinds of, of foreign language needs that, that you have in the field? And 
Um, do you have to rely on translators? So how do you negotiate the language issue and what recommendations might you have for someone interested in getting into archeology? span So I speak Arabic, I'm not fluent by a long shot, but I understand a lot, under a lot more than my colleagues think I understand. It's essential over time. Uh, I remember one of my favorite stories. Um, I, was in a, I was in an elevator with, um, with some Egyptians and we were in a hotel room, or in a, in a hotel. And they weren't being rude. They were just speaking Arabic to each other because they did not understand. They did not know that, that I spoke Arabic. And one guy turns to the other and says in Arabic, what are all these foreigners doing here? Like, cause we're in a part of Egypt where they're never foreigners. He says, I don't know, man, they're just, there's a group of them. And every day they leave and they come back and I have no idea why they're foreigners here. And I said to him in Arabic, oh, sir, it's because we're archeologists and we're working at an archeological site nearby. The look on their faces was priceless. I love doing that. Um, Anyway, you know, they, they were very apologetic. They weren't saying a single thing that was bad. They were just speaking out loud. Oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry, so excited. Welcome to Egypt. We, please let us know if we can help you. They were being quite lovely. Um, uh, and, you know, sometimes people say things that are not polite to you. And I give as good as I get. There's a whole wealth of vocabulary that I'm never allowed to use. And I enjoy using it from time to time when appropriate. Um, but yeah, it's essential. It's essential that you speak the local languages because language is culture. Right, and, and being able to speak the language, you're showing honor, you're showing respect, you're showing reverence. You know, I love telling jokes. Um, I know a lot of jokes in Arabic. Um, it is it is so important. If you understand humor in another language, you can break down barriers and connect with people. And that's ultimately all we need to do to do our work well is to connect to other humans and, and find common points of empathy. Uh, but yeah, any any for anyone who's considering um, you know a future in archaeology, you know, take French, take German, take Latin, take Spanish, whatever languages are available at your high school, because it doesn't matter if you know you're like I ultimately I want to work in Japan, but I can't take Japanese right now. But that's okay. Take other languages because in, in learning other languages, it will open up neural pathways in your brain that will allow you to learn languages better down the road and know your grammar, right? You know, to know your 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 different pronouns and your different uh, uh, tenses of a verb and um, how to parse sentences, all that stuff that you learned in grammar or in, in, as grammar in the sixth grade or seventh grade, maybe a little bit in high school that you've kind of forgotten, like that's really important for learning foreign languages. Um, so, so learn, take those other, take, take what's available um, and it will help you later on. So can you follow up and help us understand how, how you understood the text in the tomb that you showed us? Sure, so that was Middle Egyptian, so hieroglyphs. So you take um, Middle Egyptian courses uh, as an undergraduate and in graduate school if you're going to study Egyptology. I'm not fluent fluent by any means. I could read it. I'm, a, I'm super rusty. I'm not a linguist at all. There are people who specialize in ancient Egyptian language and that's exactly what they do. I don't, but I can read it-ish, you know, or have a little dictionary. If I can't remember some of the signs, I'll look them up. It all, it all comes back. It's all there stored in my brain. Um, so, um, but yeah, so that's, that's what it is. It's Middle Egyptian. It's the classic kind of lingua franca of, of the ancient Egyptian world. And we, we all take it in Egyptology. Excellent. So um, one of the questions kind of takes us back out to um, a more global perspective. So have you had an opportunity to work in China? Have you had any dealings with the uh, things like the terracotta army or um, the monument associated with the, uh, the terracotta army? Anything on that order? Yeah, so my first big international conference was in the fall of 2004 in Beijing. Um, and so I got the chance to meet with a number of my Chinese colleagues and collaborators, um, several of whom work in Xi'an. Um, and I had the chance to go on a three-day trip to visit um, the tomb of the Emperor Qin, which is the Terracotta Warriors, as well as um, burial mounds. It's an extraordinary place. So personally, I haven't dug there, but we definitely got these amazing behind the scenes tours of, um, of the Terracotta Warriors as they were coming out of the ground. And that was just like a, a once in a lifetime experience. I told you, it's my favorite part of, of being an archeologist, getting tours from these world experts. Um, you know, my husband and I got to go to back, back to Beijing a couple of years ago, uh, meet with co colleagues and collaborators. And, um, you know, again, it's just learning from these wonderful experts all over the world that makes, makes my job such a joy. Well, and I have one other question unless someone else wants to put something in the chat. And the question has to do with um, seeing any kinds of connections between um, architecture like the mound builders we see in the Eastern United States 
and the kinds of things, the kinds of architectures we see in other places like Egypt and the Near East. Right, so yeah, I get asked this question sometimes and I'll flip it back to everyone who's listening right now. So I'm sure all of you have kids or grandkids or cousins or nibblings, nieces, nephews, younger brothers, sisters. You give any small child a set of blocks, probably three-ish is about right. What is the shape that they will make with the blocks? They will build a little pyramid. Without having seen any pyramids, without knowing anything about pyramids, they will stack the blocks in a mounded shape. It is a universal symbol that every child does. It doesn't matter if the child is an American or Chinese or Ethiopian or something, it doesn't matter. It's a universal shape. So when you build something and you want to go up, you stack things or you make a mound. Pretty standard all over the world. So that's why the shapes are similar. There are these universal things that you can do with weighted material when you want to build something and move it up. Um, so a lot of people have assumed there must be a connection between ziggurats and pyramids and the mounds uh, built in the Americas and the pyramids you see in uh, Guatemala, um, the Maya uh, or, or um, uh, the Aztecs and nope. You know, maybe there's some connections-ish in Central and Southern America, but not really. Um, it's just the shapes that people make and you have to understand where and why and how. And oftentimes it's not like they just woke up one day and made a pyramid. In ancient Egypt, they started with putting people in tombs and covering them with stones and putting them deeper and deeper and deeper because dogs were probably digging up the, 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 the barrels and doing things to, to our deceased relatives that we don't want dogs to do. So you dig, dig them really deep, cover them with rocks, and then you put a protective thing on top and then you put a protective structure on top. And then the people are getting wealthier. So you add on rooms and then you add a protective structure around us. You see where this is going over hundreds and hundreds of years. These structures evolve very slowly and very carefully to where one day after hundreds of years, you have a pyramid. The pyramid doesn't appear out of nowhere. It's a long, slow evolution of architecture and development. You know, pyramids evolved over four or five hundred years. Think about think about the difference between, um, you know, car, car our our smart where my smartphone going? Anyway, smartphones are like a miracle. You know, it's like one day we woke up and we had the whole world in our pocket. It's kind of like one day we woke up and we had a pyramid. That's not true at all. Cell phones started with Alexander Graham Bell, and even before that, our ability to mine, um, you know, mine copper. Right, going back thousands of years. So this is long, slow evolution of what's possible with technology. It's like the game civilization. Um, so yeah, so to answer your question, they're not connected, but it's part of this universal series of symbols um, and, and construction techniques that we see everywhere. Apparently my, my comment about, unless there are other questions sparked a couple more questions. Uh, so one of the questions is, do you recommend that archaeology students getting, getting advanced degrees in foreign countries? Um, sometimes, yes, it just depends on where you want to go and funding and accessibility, um, you know, and your ability to want to learn other languages, because it can be much cheaper to study archaeology in other countries. Um, but you may have to learn Danish or Norwegian or French. So, you know, definitely consider it, look into it. Uh, you may or may not be eligible, but it all depends on funding. And then the uh, last question I have in the chat has to do with um, how some of the technology has improved our understanding of the Nazca lines as compared to the aerial flyovers that they did back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, et cetera. Right. You well, did show some, some Peruvian right. stuff already. Right, so yeah, so you know, we, um, a lot of the, the discoveries that are being made right now are showing kind of earlier versions of the Nazca line. So again, we see these glorious geoglyphs of massive you know, eagles and monkeys and, and other figures. They didn't just evolve overnight, right? So people would have experimented smaller and gotten bigger and they would have gotten bigger over time. Um, and that's what these, these satellite images are showing. It's showing these earlier developments of the Nazca lines and how they developed um, you know, from, from kind of small symbols into what we see today. And they're helping archeologists to understand better their purpose and their function. All right, well, I don't see any other questions in the chat, Sarah, so you might actually have covered most of the, the questions here. Oh, and now we're getting some thank yous. Oh, thank <laughs> so you, it's been delightful. 
And I'm going to turn it back over to Will and I will see you tomorrow morning. Thank you, Sarah. Can't wait. Can't wait. Thank you. All right. Well, um, again, I want to thank everyone uh, who's attended. I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Steve Lexen, for um, being uh, for joining us as well. We love it when we have uh, uh, past DEA recipient, uh, recipients uh, join us. And uh, with that, I'll uh, sign off and uh, and thank you all so much. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye -bye. Good night.